Good day. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Scott Levin from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in the United States. And I want to thank Dr. Santa Maria and the organizers of this uh, virtual uh, master series, Microsurgery for the Residents. I've been doing microsurgery for a very long time. And as early as uh, 1974, when I was a college student, saw my first replantation. So uh, more than four decades, I've seen the evolution of reconstructive microsurgery and the last 30 years as a practicing surgeon. Today, I'd like to talk to you about hand transplantation, our experience here at the University of Pennsylvania, where we have an active uh, adult as well as pediatric hand transplant program. In about 25 minutes, it's very difficult to cover the entire field, but I'm going to share with you the highlights of what you should be thinking about and what you should know from a historic basis about this ex exciting aspect of reconstructive microsurgery. Um, these are my disclosures. I have funding from the DOD, uh, I have funding from uh, the Department of Defense for VCA research and from the Hans Jörg Peace Foundation. If you remember nothing from my talk, understand that we're in the continuum on what we call the microsurgical reconstructive ladder. In the 70s, as I said, the only microsurgery I knew was seeing amputated fingers and hands reattached, major limb replantation, and starting in 1973 with the hallmark work of Ian Taylor in Melbourne, Australia, the world's first free flap was done. And then an explosion of autogenous free tissue transfer uh, has been uh, evolving over the last several decades. And we've gone from large composite flaps like the myocutaneous flap, or even things like the fasciocutaneous scapular flap to uh, chimeric flaps, uh, prefabricated, pre-expanded flaps has been described by Prebase, the perforator flap con concept that is really known around the world uh, that is mainly performed for breast reconstruction and even a uh, high percentage of our lower extremity reconstructions are now done with perforator flaps. Based on our understanding of perforators, uh, we can even design so-called freestyle flaps, the term popularized by Fuchan Wei and Asao Koshima uh, and J.P. Hong and, and others from the uh, Far East. And then the highest rung on the reconstructive microsurgical ladder is uh, VCA. And there's a picture of Harold Gillies who reminded us that our goal in reconstructive surgery is to replace like in kind. Hand transplantation carries with it all of the principles of care uh, that we do in conventional microsurgery. Ethically, should we or shouldn't we do a case? Can we do this safely, even in old patients or patients with morbidities, comorbidities? We do this every day. Uh, you don't go into the operating room having never attempted a flap or performed a flap and try to do it on a, on a patient. So cadaveric preparation is essential. The doctor-patient relationship, what are the things we can do to decrease risk? Uh, and avoiding complications. If we stop there, that's the same principle of care for anything we do in reconstructive microsurgery. The gentleman pictured here works with Ed Rodriguez at the uh, New York University. His name is Arthur Kaplan, and he's a bioethicist who used to be at the University of Pennsylvania, who gave me the green light to start a hand transplant program here in 2009 when I arrived at University of Pennsylvania. And the hallmark and why vascularized allotransplantation is different and what is unique about hand transplant is that there is a potential what we call exit strategy. If the hand is not functioning after transplantation, if there's unbridled rejection, if there's systemic issues that uh, are compromising the health of the patient, the arms or arms or hands that are transplanted can be reamputated. This has been done in certain places around the world for a certain uh, subset of populations who either their transplant is not functioning or places them at risk. Exit strategy means the arms that are transplanted are then reamputated. 
And so that's unique to hand transplantation. The hands themselves are organs. They're considered organs, just like a heart or a liver or a lung in our uh, United States um, codes of medical conduct. We have uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, our Food and Drug Administration, Health and Human Services, uh, regulatory bodies such as UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. We have transplant societies, the ASRT, the American Society of Reconstructive Transplantation, the American Society of Transplant Surgery, internationally, TTS, the Transplant Society. This is an alphabet soup, and all of these organizations have embraced the concept that hand transplants are what we call vascularized composite allotransplants. They used to be called composite tissue allotransplant, but tissue denotes tissue has a connotation or is defined historically as allograft. So we're not doing, uh, we're doing essentially, yes, vascularized allografts, but the proper term for several years has been VCA, vascularized composite allotransplant and hands, faces, abdominal wall, <clears throat> abdominal wall, the penis, larynx are considered transplantable organs. Uh, obviously there's an international society and those of us involved with hand transplant contribute our data and our case list to the international registry. The IRHCTT uh, is the international society uh, for vascularized composite allotransplantation, ISVCA. And you can go on their website to see the world experience, find out about our international meetings and so forth. And this has all grown up uh, over the last 20 years. Charles Bell, the uh, British anatomist and surgeon said that hands are the ready instruments of the mind. And so keep in mind, no pun intended, that thought, about the connection of the hand to the human brain. And loss of hands is a loss of connection to our cerebral cortex, to our pre and post central gyrus. And this will come in uh, to play in a few minutes when I talk about our pediatric program. Every resident and fellow around the world should know that <clears throat> Joseph Murray did the first kidney transplant in 1954 between two twins, the Herrick twins in Boston, and they didn't require immunosuppression. And he was a craniofacial surgeon, but in later years uh, was a big proponent of hand transplant uh, as the next wave of solid organ transplant. And of course, Tom Starzl did the world's first liver transplant in 1967 in a three-year-old child. Unfortunately, that child died, but he persisted and developed liver transplant and Starzl, of course, was a very big proponent of uh, hand transplant and the new field of organ transplant called VCA, vascularized composite allot transplant. And this is me with him. Uh, certainly he is deceased now as is Dr. Murray, but I had the occasion to meet him and interface with him in Innsbruck, Austria, where Stefan Schneeberger uh, hosted um, uh, several symposia uh, on uh, allotransplantation. This is our first patient and the, the patients that we have the most familiarity with here uh, are quadrimembral amputees. As a matter of fact, all of our patients that we consider are severely disabled with withdrawal from society. Uh, many are totally dependent on those around them for care. And you see this young girl is not wearing her prosthetics. Uh, her arms are on the floor and a couple of her leg components are on the credenza next to her. Um, it's essential. One of the principles of hand transplant is that you have a cadaver facility for rehearsal. This is us preparing. Each, each transplant we've done takes about two years for our team to prepare. We work with our nurses, our anesthesiologists on fresh cadavers. And what is essential, if you go somewhere or you are somewhere where you're considered doing this, you have to have a strong proponent in the solid organ transplant community uh, who does livers or hearts or lungs or kidneys. Uh, and this is uh, Abraham Shaked, uh, my transplant partner at Penn. 
who's head of our Penn Transplant Institute and is a very prominent liver surgeon who embraced the concept of developing the program here. And so that's very, very important. Ben Franklin, who started the University of Pennsylvania said, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. And so the rehearsals as I described, and this is our cadaver lab are essential that everybody knows their place, everybody knows what structures they're gonna be working on, who's gonna be doing the micro, who are the best people to do the nerve coaptation that are absolutely critical uh, in proximal level arm transplants that the neural uh, neurography, if you will, is done at the best possible ability to align donor and recipient fascicles so that um, motor re can occur just like it does in the functional muscle transfers that we've done for almost 40, 40 years. Failure is not an option. Uh, this is Gene Krantz, who was the commander of the mission to land a man on the a moon, our Apollo 13 astronauts. And so the first transplant you do, you don't want to fail. You design a process. This is the grid. And I'll keep this up on the screen for a few seconds. Just who are the people? When are they entering? What are they doing? And when are they doing it? And everybody at the rehearsals is assigned structures, bone, vascular, tendon, nerve, uh, forearm procurement, forearm preparation, so forth and so on. This is the checklist. A great book, if you're interested, is by Atul Gawandi, The Checklist Manifesto. Again, he's from the same hospital that Joe Murray was from, Peter Van Brigham in Boston in the Harvard system, and wrote the importance of having a checklist. And this is literally the clipboard we used the times we did to fix our structures, this is based on a rehearsal, but develop a checklist. And uh, these are the rehearsals. We used cutting guides for our osteotomies, which decrease time and increase osteosynthesis, ac osteosynthesis accuracy. The labeling of the structures you're going to encounter important. That saves time and helps. And then uh, again, we rehearse all these steps. Uh, this is a distal. Uh, form uh, at the level of the wrist. You can see on the top left the flare of the distal radius. And these are in our cadaver lab rehearsing. And you develop a team of our nurses and residents and fellows and attending surgeons to do the work. The woman I showed you who's sitting in the wheelchair, this is her about two and a half years later. Her functional muscle transfers were into her arm transplants at the level of the elbow. And she gained not only extrinsic function, but after three years, intrinsic function, which is almost unheard of if you were to lacerate the median and ulnar nerve at the level of the elbow, but based on the calcineurin inhibitors, uh, they, they continue to promote neural regeneration, and this is her doing CrossFit and uh, on the rings. And I challenge any of you to find an amputee uh, that could hang from the rings or do this kind of work, and as you know, she's wearing her lower extremity prosthetics. We have an international program. This is Laurent Lanteri, who shared two of his patients with me that have been transplanted here at Penn Medicine. This is Laura Nataf, done uh, about uh, four years ago. And here she is, uh, only at seven months. And you can see that her extrinsic uh, function had not yet returned. But within seven months, as we'd expect, if you were doing a functional gracilis uh, or a, 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 a functional muscle transfer, that the donor muscles from the donor become re by the recipient. And particularly in the proximal level uh, amputees that are transplanted without motor neural recovery and functional muscle recovery, uh, I would consider the operations for transplant failure. So the functional muscle the muscles have to function, they have to become re -innervated. What are the patient costs? Um, certainly lifelong immunosuppression. Different countries around the world, this is paid for or not paid for. Uh, a very lengthy hospitalization, actually coming down. Two or three weeks in the hospital, usually in our cases now, and a very long rehabilitation. Two to three years of several hours a day uh, optimize the outcome. Uh, certainly there's secondary effects of the immunosuppression. Uh, things like renal insufficiency, uh, a, pro a propensity to develop infections, uh, the need for uh, surveillance uh, and to monitor for rejection, 
But at the end of the day, uh, the function and restoration of a patient's dignity is what's important. These are the charges and the costs. Charges are different than costs and different health systems around the world pay for this or don't pay for this. Just as important as showing you success in the patients I'll share with you are those that are superb uh, technical candidates. This is the quadrimembral amputee, um, all five digits missing and a, a distal amputation on her left side. However, no social support, no economic support. Uh, she's still recovering from her multi-organ system failure, has not even learned to use lower extremity prosthetics, and for a variety of reasons, while she'd be a great technical candidate for bilateral hand transplant, her social uh, and psychological factors precluded us from doing that. Here's another patient who had bilateral ALT flaps done uh, to resurface his lower extremities, uh, a proximal um, bilateral just below elbow uh, candidate, was very happy with his bilateral prosthetics and we did not proceed. Many of you around the world have had uh, observations or may be involved with hand transplant programs. The list of countries in, in increases. Uh, we have many wounded warriors from our uh, longstanding 20-year uh, conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan that are deserving. And of course, we've developed a pediatric program here. And if this was your child, this is a latissimus dorsi free flap on the elbow of a child that I reconstructed to preserve the elbow joint uh, years ago before we even had an inkling or thought of hand transplant. At this point, if it was your child and a unilateral amputee, would you consider him for vascularized allotransplant? transplant? Um, there, in the pediatric population, there are three scenarios. Child has a functioning organ that's immunosuppressed and may need uh, a VCA. There are children that require perhaps a kidney or a heart or a lung and hands. And then um, a patient, a small child needs only the VCA and the rest of the uh, organs are normal. And that occurred in Poland in a child that had uh, a, uh, a larynx transfer that won the best prize the American Society of uh, Reconstructive Microsurgery last year, uh, and that child was not immunosuppressed until he received the larynx. We've done a lot of bench research on consecutive transplants. Uh, there has been other pediatric experience. Harry Bunke transferred omentum between twins, just like Joe Murray did kidney transplants. They were identical twins, so did not require immunosuppression. There were um, two children that were born twins, uh, Path Manathan from Malaysia did a um, fanatization of one of the twins who had an encephalocele, transferred the arm to the other twin, and Ron Sucre has used uh, leg transplants in Siamese twins. A lot of decision dynamics were preferable to pediatric allotransplantation. These are some of the patients we've considered. Uh, as you can see here, this child needed a heart transplant and needed three extremities reconstructed because of multi-organ systems failure, but uh, succumbed to the heart insufficiency before he could be transplanted. And so here's our first uh, pediatric patient. The child is now five years following transplant. You can see that the child was able to do rudimentary things, but certainly uh, not the same as uh, a normal child. Again, some of our lab research uh, and our preoperative planning that involved creating uh, models that would allow us to judge whether the donor for pediatric hand transplant would be the correct size. And indeed, as you see here on the right, uh, this was our model and this was the donor. So we got very lucky. And this took place uh, almost five years ago in Little Zion Harvey. And here he is in about two years, you would expect in the child who had distal hand transplants for his intrinsics to recover. And that's exactly what you can see here with excellent opposition. And just contrast that to what this child's life would be like uh, without um, hands and the use of uh, prosthetics. Um, we learned a lot from his uh, brain, studying the resurgence of the pre and post-century uh, central gyrus centers for uh, hand 
thumb, digits, uh, sensory, and motor. I remember Charles Bell said, the hand is the ready instrument of the mind. And so this connection of the mind that was lost when this little boy at two lost his hands was regained at six, and now he's 13 years old. So um, there's a lot of research that we're doing on vascularized joint transfer. I won't go over that, but there are also regulatory issues, at least in the United States, not so much on organ allocation or finding the parts, but the economic issues of who's going to pay for the transplant. Uh, we've yet to have a new immunotherapy drugs in the last decade for solid organ, for kidney, heart, lung, and hopefully if we can develop cellular strategies and drugs with less toxicity, VCA will become, I think, uh, more uh, mainstream, but it's, it, it's selected in uh, very few patients now. So I want to skip ahead. There are other children that are deserving, uh, and, and the future of limb reconstruction, I think, is uh, very bright. Uh, this is little Zion uh, celebrating, I think that's uh, three or four years. Uh, and uh, let me get to uh, the uh, end here and share this video with you of our team. Zion Harvey lost both hands and legs below the knee when willing to try the still rare procedure sur les conseils du professeur Lantieri Laura s'inscrit sur la liste d'attente aux États-Unis hand transplant surgery a procedure so delicate and rare giving Lindsay new hands real ones from a donor there, there's an expression in surgery preparation is the only shortcut you need are endlessly expressive. They help us convey thoughts and feelings, soothe with a gentle touch, enable us to care for ourselves and for others. There's perhaps no better way we express ourselves than through our hands. Living a life without hands, a person loses a sense of self Independence is challenged. Dependent on others for the most basic tasks, it is impossible not to become isolated from the outside world. A vital method for establishing human connection is lost. I've accepted the fact that my feet are gone. Like, that's acceptable to me. My hands is not, it's still not. In my dreams, I always have my hands. I know from the experience we've had at Penn, with patients who have had hand transplants, that just the mere fact that their body image is restored, uh, they can wave, they can gesticulate like I'm doing when I'm speaking, that's a pretty profound thing when you, you think about it. As one of only a few medical centers in the world where this surgery is performed, Penn Medicine is breaking new ground for transplant patients by connecting the top medical experts locally and around the world to conquer new frontiers in the emerging field of vascularized composite allo transplantation, the transplant of body parts such as hands and faces to recipients who have lost these parts. The discipline of vascularized composite allo transplantation uses an operating microscope to guide the connection of arteries, veins, and nerves. It is a new discipline, as innovative and exciting as any in medicine today. Hours and hours of surgical rehearsal and practice over two years' time allow the team to prepare for each patient's operation. Envisioning the possibilities has become the life's work of Penn surgeon, Dr. L. Scott Levin. I trained uh, first, I uh, did fusion general surgery, where I was exposed to pediatric surgery. And then I trained in orthopedics and did my pediatric orthopedic surgery at the Shriners Hospital System. I did all the congenital hand surgery at Duke for almost 20 years, then came to Philadelphia and being trained both in orthopedics and plastic surgery and doing lots of pediatric microsurgery, pediatric hand surgery, um, pediatric reconstructive surgery, 
The world of hand surgery, of course, is in adults and children. This is an absolute passion of mine, and uh, I've always loved that. And this is just the next extension of hand transplant surgery. Connecting all the dots to make this complex, multidisciplinary surgery a success is a monumental undertaking. By marshalling the best and brightest in their respective disciplines, Dr. Levin has assembled a team that is second to none and orchestrated it to perfection. In team, the acronym is Together Everyone Achieves More, T-E-A-M, and I've always believed that. You know, this is a cast of many entities, our internal medicine colleagues, uh, anesthesia, nursing, social work, pharmacy. Uh, these kinds of operations touch everyone in a health system. So we had really incredible surgical talent. Last summer, Zion made history, becoming the first ever child recipient of a double hand transplant. The nearly 11-hour procedure paving a long road to recovery, marked with a rigorous therapy regimen. Earlier this month, he got to throw out the first pitch at the Baltimore Orioles game. Laura s'est très vite appropriée ses nouvelles mains. Elle commence à plier ses doigts, à bouger ses poignets, à tenir des objets. So have you looked yet? No. Okay. I've only looked, peeked down at this one thumb. They feel like normal fingers, you know, normal hands. This is more than we could ever hope for. Her blood pressure is good. All the parameters are good related to how the blood flow is in and out of her new arms. I mean, this is a, if you will, a picture perfect course so far. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. What has happened at Penn Medicine is not science fiction. It is real science involving real people. Here, now, today. As in any emerging field, there is still much more to be learned. But with Dr. Levin's leadership in this highly specialized discipline, Penn Medicine is going beyond excellence and eminence to preeminence, giving his patients a chance they could only dream of a short time ago, to reconnect with others and with the world.